Uh, why don't we open in prayer before we do today's reading. Father, we come to you in prayer and help us to always come to you in prayer. Let it be the first thing we do, the first thing we think of to come to you. And instead of it being the last resort, we worship you. We praise you and acknowledge you as our God. And we humble ourselves before you, recognizing that, that, we are, that we are just sinners saved by grace and that you are a holy, righteous God who loves us and that it is your love that you showed to us that while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us on the cross. And you are just an amazing God. And we have so much to look forward to, even in these dark times. Every time in the scriptures uh, there is persecution, there is darkness facing the church, uh, you remind the church of all the promises of what is and what is to come, that you are God, that you are sovereign and on the throne, and that you have won the victory, and that one day all things will be made right. And one day we will all be in heaven together, rejoicing together, praising you, leaping for joy uh, maybe or maybe not having small talk of different kinds. But we are just so looking forward to the time when you are ruling the earth, where you come and make all things new and make all things right. Remind us of the promises of your scripture as we face these dark times. Help us to be steadfast and courageous, standing firm on the word of God. We thank you for all these things and ask that you be with us today as we spend our time worshiping you and studying your word together and fellowshipping together. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Speaking of encouragement, uh, a little bit of a longer reading this morning from Romans 8. Uh, one of my favorite parts of Scripture and one of the parts of Scripture that I find myself going back to frequently uh, when I'm in need of encouragement or when I just want to uh, have a smile. When I just want to, some Scripture you read and it just leaves you with a little grin on your face because you know God keeps his word. And so this is one of those places. We'll start in Romans 8, 28, which is a reminder. This is everything we're about to read is for believers. So you ever go to a, um, a big city and they, they have these special clubs. And it's like, oh, this is just for VIP only section or just for important people over here. And so, oh, well, you can't go there. You can't sit there. You can't come through here because this isn't for you. This is for someone else. Well, everything that we're about to read here, all these promises in God's word are for believers and believers only. And so we remember that and are encouraged by it as we start in Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, that's us, that all things work together for good even when things don't go our way or the way we want them to, they're always going to go the way God wants them to. So we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, not my purpose, your purpose, his purpose, which is very freeing when you think about it. You, we, don't, we can rel relinquish the keys. I don't have to come up with the game plan for my life. God has done it already. And so, again, this is all for us. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God has everyone that God saves. He has predestined. He has made the ordained claim that you will be like Christ. So if you're like me and you find moments of frustration as you grow in Christ, you're like, gosh, I'm just the closer I get, the more I see how, how sinful I really am. Take heart that he has ordained that you will be transformed and recreated in the image of Christ. In other words, that he will finish the good work that he has begun in you. So if you say, I'm so tired of my sin, I'm so grieving over my sin, I'm so tired that I still sin, I'm, I'm still battling this, I'm still battling that. Oh, I'm so much further than I was at the beginning, but boy, I still will take heart because he has said that everyone that he has called and predestined, he is going to turn into or be conformed to the image of his son, Christ. He does that in order that Christ might be the firstborn among, among many brothers, and that those who he predestined, he also called. Here's a, here's a mathematical formula. That those he predestined, those that God predestined, he calls. And those whom he called, he also justified. So if God calls someone, he will justify them, make them right with him. And those who he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. There's the same statement said in another way. Everyone that God calls and predestines will be conformed to the image of Christ, made to look like Christ, be like Christ. Oh, what a glorious 
day that will be. I don't even, I can't even fathom that, but I know I want it with every fiber in my being. And then the same way this mathematical formula that comes right after that promise says the same thing, that those who God predestines, he calls, and those who he calls, he justifies, makes right with himself. And anybody he makes right with himself, he will glorify, which is another way of saying making like Christ. Making us like Christ. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Remember those words. If God be for us, who can be against us? We need to hear that in these times and as times get darker and darker. For he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In other words, if God is willing to sacrifice his own son for you and me, will he not also take care of every other need we have? That's what he's saying. What encouragement. And it's, it's, it's left open on purpose because he will meet all your needs. Not your felt needs, but your real needs. God will take sure, take, make sure that he meets them all. That's why it's written this way. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn when Christ Jesus is the one who died? More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? So even when Satan stands up there, the great accuser, and says, look at Michael, he's so awful, he's such a hypocrite, oh, look at how filthy he is, oh, he's awful, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter, because we have the great intercessor of Christ, so I don't even have to worry about that. I can have peace and glorify God even in that circumstance. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or democratically held Congress and <laughs> presidency? What shall? What shall separate us from the love of Christ? No tribulation, no distress, no persecution, no famine, no nakedness, no danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors, not by our own strength, but by through him who loves us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, just in case I missed anything, anything else in all of creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That wonderful promise does, says nothing about how tightly you hang on to Christ. It's all about how tightly he's hanging on to us. And he hangs on tightly, perfectly. And so nothing can separate us from his love. Do you notice it's all about him? It's all about him, his love. Nothing can separate us from him. Nothing can pry his fingers off us. And this is also a promise that God will not say, I'm done with you. To anyone who he has justified, predestined, called, justified. He, he's never going to say, you know what, I changed my mind. What a wonderful thought. That none of these things that Paul mentioned, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. Let's remember that as we worship and praise God this morning together.